Okay, so welcome to another Random Bits video. Uh, this time we've got a rare piece of Commodore history. This is the C64 Link cartridge, and it was made by a company called Richville Telecommunications. And they're a Canadian company, which is kind of cool. So this cartridge basically does a few different things. The first thing it does when it's plugged into your Commodore 64 is it upgrades your Commodore Basic from version 2.0 to version 4.0. And that gives you access to 16 additional disk drive commands which were available and pretty familiar to Commodore PET users, uh, but were not available on the Commodore 64. Now, the reason that you would want to do that is that they're giving you this edge connector here, which is an IEEE 488 interface that allows you to connect a variety of Commodore drives like the 4040, the 8050, drives you could not connect to the Commodore 64 natively. And then the third thing that this cartridge did is it provides you with a machine language monitor that you can break into and basically view and edit memory contents and essentially program in machine language. So there's quite a bit that's packed into this thing and um, I don't know what they retailed for. Uh, I know what I paid for this one, but I would imagine they represent a pretty good value for what they were. Now, this is the first version of this card. There's actually two versions. The second version is this one. This is the C64 Link 2, and it's essentially the same cartridge as the C64 Link, um, but there's one critical difference, and that is that it has this little edge connector on the side here. And basically what this did is if you had a special cable, and I regret I don't remember what the name of it was, I think it's called a VL1 or VL3, you can actually daisy chain a whole bunch of Commodore 64s together and connect them to a peripheral like a printer or say a Model 4040 drive, and they essentially become a Commodore 64 network. And so basically what it does is it controls the traffic coming from all of those Commodore 64s uh, to ensure that things are handled in kind of an orderly way. So basically print jobs, if you can call them print jobs, are, are done one at a time rather than everything hitting the printer or the disk drive all at once. Now, the reason that I know about these cards at all is because I actually had contemporaneous experience with them back in the late 80s. In around 1987, I was going into middle school at a private school, and the school hadn't updated their equipment yet to PCs. They were going to do that the next year. Uh, so they still had up on the fourth floor a lab full of Commodore 64s. And basically they were all arranged in a U shape around the perimeter of the classroom. They were all wired together using these Link 2 cards and there was a 4040 drive at the far end of the classroom that basically they all used as their drive. I don't think there was a printer there. I, I could be wrong on that. Um, it's, it's been a long time <laughs> since grade seven, so uh, it's quite possible I've forgotten that. All the computers are in these brown steel lock boxes, so you could not mess with them. They were absolutely locked down. Uh, all the cables were hidden. There was really nothing that you could mess with with these things at all. And all of the computers, except for the teacher's computer, had either amber or green monochrome monitors. The teacher's computer, for whatever reason, had color. Now, in terms of how a Commodore 64 network worked back in the day, uh, again, I'm going back on very, very old memories, but I distinctly remember the teacher often having to set things up in the first few minutes of class, which basically involved popping in a disc into the 4040 for whatever program we were going to be loading that day, and then going around to each individual computer and issuing the load commands. And computers would load up one by one, and then we would be off on our lesson, theoretically. I remember it didn't always work that way. Uh, sometimes, for whatever reason, something went wrong with the 4040 drive, or uh, the computers locked up, or our students were, you know, screwing around with things and <laughs> uh, with the usual results. But overall, it was a pretty reliable system. The software that was being used was designed with this quote-unquote Commodore 64 network in mind, so that seemed to be fine. And then every now and again, computer class would end up on a Friday, and when that happened, our teacher, who was kind of a you know rock and roll enthusiast, um, really cool guy, basically would allow us to play games for that class rather than actually doing any work. Um, and so they would go around and basically try to load each computer with a game, usually games that we brought in because a lot of us had our own Commodore 64s, or sometimes the teacher would bring something to show us because he thought it was really cool. Uh, in fact, that's how I actually first came across Hacker because our teacher brought that in because he wanted to show us what uh, hacking, <laughs> what his idea of hacking would be like uh, in the future. Uh, and when we did that, that's often when 
we ran into the most trouble because um, I, I don't know what exactly was causing the issue. I don't know if it was conflicts between the computers, um, if it was problems with the discs themselves. Um, I know the Commodore 4040 and the 1541 can read each other's discs fairly competently, but I think they have issues with writing to each other's discs and some programs need to write to discs so that was creating some issues i think a fair number of games worked probably about half of them but there were quite a few that didn't um, maybe some of them had issues with the uh, upgraded basic that could be another thing maybe that set them off whatever it was uh, a lot of games did not work but some did and uh, the ones that did uh, we happily played for the afternoon and I got this Link 2 cartridge from that lab, uh, basically when they dismantled it. Unfortunately, I wasn't fast enough to save any of the cases. I think the school basically sold off everything, but one of these was left lying around and my computer science teacher said, here, you can have it. Now, unfortunately, this particular cartridge has never worked for me. If you look at a photograph of another C64 Link 2 cartridge, you'll see there's two little jumper cables with alligator clips, and basically you connect them to pins inside the Commodore 64, and somehow that connects everything up and away it goes. But this one doesn't have those wires and I don't know if that's on purpose or not, um, or if they were broken off. I don't think so. I don't see any evidence of anything having broken off. Um, but yeah, for whatever reason, this one doesn't work. However, this one does. Um, this is one that I just bought on eBay recently and uh, I've actually plugged it in and verified that everything comes up. Okay, so I'll just lift the lids off here. I've already unscrewed the back. So you can see the uh, Link 1 is pretty basic. Um, I'm pretty sure this is just a PIA chip, peripheral interface adapter. And then on the back we have the ROM uh, or EEPROM that contains the uh, basic version 4 as well as the uh, system monitor. But yeah, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. It wouldn't be very difficult at all to, uh, to replicate one of these. And there's actually been dumps of the EEPROM uh, that have been put online by others, so. And then the Link 2, we've got a peripheral interface adapter on this side, and we've got the EEPROM on the other. Now, the interesting thing about this one is I mentioned uh, they're supposed to have those little alligator clips that come off, but in the areas where those would have soldered in, um, they've got these jumper wires installed, so. I don't know if somebody modified this to try and avoid the need for the alligator clips or what the story was there. So they're pretty simple devices. I don't think it would be very hard at all to replicate these. And I have thought of doing that. I'm kind of fixing on one day rebuilding a Commodore network, maybe from two or three machines. Um, I kind of regret uh, that recently I took a pass on a couple of Commodore 64 lock cases that were identical to the ones in our school computer lab. Um, I would have loved to have taken those, put a couple of my bread bin 64s in them and basically set them up with these C64 Link 2 cartridges, but uh, yeah, I just didn't, uh, I didn't have the money at the time and yeah, I just let them go. But hopefully they'll come up again and if they ever do, then I might actually make a project of replicating this. Uh, if I can figure out what the wiring of this, uh, I think they called it a VL1 or VL3 cable, uh, for this edge connector here was, um, then I should hopefully be able to build a little mini Commodore 64 network. And if I do that, I'll definitely make a video of it. Okay, so for our test rig here, I have my childhood Commodore 64C, which I got sometime around 1988 or 1989. Um, and it was actually a replacement. Uh, we had a Commodore 64 going all the way back to 1982, but uh, the original bread bin machine had died and my dad got sick of my pouting. So I finally uh, replaced it with this one. Uh, for a monitor, I've got an Amiga monitor that I had kicking around. Um, I do have a couple of 1702s, but they are are buried in storage right now and I'm just not going to pull them out. And then I also have this CBM model 8050 drive, um, which I got at the same time that I got this Link 2 cartridge and a Commodore Super Pet. Uh, it all came from my school. Um, prior to their Commodore 64 lab, they had had a lab full of Commodore Pets 
and uh, I believe this drive was used there as well as the 4040 and basically that lab had been dismantled and some of the Commodore pets were sort of scattered around the school being used in places like the business office or uh, for certain classes and I noticed one day that they were slowly disappearing so I went to my teacher and said uh, hey is there any chance I could purchase one because I had always wanted one um, from childhood um, because that was the first computer I ever experienced and uh, they just had one left it was a Commodore Super Pet and an 8050 drive and the teacher said here just take these and yeah that was the best free <laughs> computer ever so I kept that computer in my room in my parents house I wasn't really a serious collector at this point I basically had just wanted that computer and I was looking for a purpose for it and I thought okay well maybe I'll use it as a diary system right I'll just program a digital diary and uh, I'll make entries into it every day and that'll let me use the Commodore PET on a fairly regular basis and, and have some legitimate use. Because remember, this is this would have been the early 90s, probably like 1992, and we didn't have internet and it wasn't very easy to get software back and forth from uh, a PC to a computer like the PET. And I didn't have any software, so that was basically what I had to do was just sort of make my own. So yeah, in around 1992, when I had the pet set up in my house, I decided to program a digital diary. And uh, that was kind of my first real crack at programming. And I was pretty proud of what I came up with. I, I managed to create a sort of sequential database type thing uh, that would store entries for different years. And then of course, different days and months of the year. I didn't use it very religiously and uh, it pretty much fell apart after like, I think the first couple months of using it. And I basically just forgot about the thing, but I thought it would be a neat thing to drag out here almost 30 years later and take another look at it. And uh, hopefully there's nothing too embarrassing in there, but I figured that'd be a good way to test the compatibility with the basic four that's on this cartridge versus the pet, which I'm told is pretty much identical. So what we'll do is we'll plug in our C64 link cartridge, just like that. And then I've got my IEEE 488 cable here. And then we'll turn on the model 8050 It's got a little bit of a whistle to it there. And then finally, we will turn the 64 on after I plug it in, of course. That would be useful. And there we go. Um, one thing I've noticed with this that's different when I operate this drive with the pet, usually when you turn the pet on, the lights will blink, sort of acknowledging that it's there, whereas it doesn't do it with this cartridge. But uh, that's just a minor difference. Okay, so the first thing we notice is we no longer have Commodore Basic V2, we have V4. So that shows us this cartridge is working. Uh, the next thing we notice is we've taken a little bit of a hit to the available free memory. It usually says about 38,000 basic bytes free, but we're down to about 30 now. So basically we've lost eight kilobytes in order to accommodate the version four basic, as well as the system monitor uh, that is also now memory resident. So I guess the first thing we'll show off is the system monitor, um, cause it's pretty basic. You basically invoke it by simply typing monitor. And there you go. You've got basically your registers, your program counter, your accumulator, your X and Y registers, and your stack pointer. I forget what SR stands for, but <laughs> that's basically the, the gist of it. Uh, if I wanted to display the contents of memory, I can hit M and do say F00. And that shows me what's currently sitting in memory there. If I wanted to run something, I could hit G and then give it an address and it would run it. Um, but of course, if I do that right now, it's probably just gonna freeze right up. You can also save things to tape. If you do uh, something like this, like my file, And basically what this will do is it will save to disk uh, everything between these memory contents. Now I'm not gonna hit that because I believe what the cartridge does is it reroutes everything so that if you're loading or saving to device eight drive number one, instead of going to a 1541 drive off this port, it actually goes to the 8050. Now I was mistaken about one thing about the ROM that I said earlier. I don't think you can actually edit memory contents here. I think you can only load those in uh, via tape. 
So I don't know how that exactly works. If you, I don't know if you create something offline in some kind of format, like an S record, and then it reads it in. I'm not really sure how that part of it works, but you can't dynamically alter memory contents just through the monitor, which, which is kind of a strange design decision, but you know, that is what it is. Okay, so what we'll do now is basically we will, I got to refresh my memory on what exactly is on the disks. And I'm going to try using the standard Commodore 64 commands because according to the C64 link cartridge manual, it actually remaps those commands so that they will go to your IEEE 488 device rather than out the normal port to where it's expecting a 1541 drive. So if I were to do a directory listing, I can do it literally just like that. And you'll see the drive light up. And then we can do list. Now, isn't this interesting? It actually lists the contents of both drives. So that's kind of neat. Um, now you can see here that the uh, characters are slightly off. And again, this is because I was programming this on a Commodore Super Pet, which is basically an 8032. So it's an 80 character mode and basically it's running typically in lower case. But I can compensate for that by switching the 64 into lowercase mode by hitting the chicken lips logo and shift. Or Commodore key and shift. And basically now you can see how they were formatted on the pet. Another thing you can do if you just want to list the contents of the directory is you can do uh, D shift IR D0. And that basically has the same effect as catalog D0. So basically one of the attractions of this card is the addition of 16 uh, basic for disk drive control commands. Um, and these are all obviously useful with um, IEEE 488 devices like the 8050. So for example, if I wanted to format a disk, I just put it in the drive there. That's good to go. And then I do header and then I give it a name, say test one. And then I do comma D zero, which is drive zero. And then I give it an ID number. I'll just invent something. These are just to tell the computer or the drive that the disk has been changed if it gets changed. And then I hit enter and then I get, are you sure? And then that's basically it. We just kind of wait um, it will come back to a prompt, but the drive is actually still formatting. The formats on these drives take quite a while. <laughs> um, it says in the instructions anywhere from 2 to 14 minutes, and that's kind of what I remember uh, when I was using the Commodore PET. So this drive light will stay lit until it's finished, and then basically it will stop, and we should have a green light here when it's done. And uh, it looks like this drive is generating some interference with the monitor here. Um, I tried to move them as far away as I could, and it did make it a little better, but it's, uh, yeah, it's still putting some bands in the screen. And there we are. So I got a nice green light there. Everything looks good. Uh, so now if I do a catalog, you can see I've got my tests. So another command I can do here, um, I'll put my diary disk in. And there is a command you can do called backup. And you can say backup D1 to D0. So I'm going to copy everything from this drive over to that one. And I believe the backup command basically does a header as part of the operation and then basically copies everything over. So we'll just see sort of what we get here. The other thing about the backup command is it's only designed to work with dual drive units, um, but Richfield actually provided a utility program for single drives called SuperCopy, and that program uh, claims that it could make a backup on a single drive in less than seven minutes. <laughs> hmm, okay, that looks like an error, so I wonder what happened. Well, it's supposed to work. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know what happened there. Okay, so that didn't work. Uh, so I've reformatted the disk in drive zero there. I'm not sure why the backup command's not working, but it could be any number of things. Um, maybe what I will try is the copy command. So first of all, I've got my disk with data on it in drive one. So 
So let's just review on what's in there. And I'll try copy. I'm gonna put in the source drive number. And the file name. Oops. To the destination drive. Let's see what happens here. Okay, so that worked. And copy can do the entire drive from one to the other. So let's try copy D1 to D0. I didn't like that. I think it may be that there may be some bad sectors or something going on. Forgot the two. Yeah, I mean, that's working. Okay, let's see, what else can we do? We can, uh, well, let's make a program. Just one of my counter things. And then I can desave. zero. Uh, let's expand it a bit here. And then I'll desave this as well. And I'll explain where I'm going with this in a second. So now I've got my two programs on there, counter one and count two. If I said, oh, I made a mistake, I'm just gonna delete that first program. I can delete it by typing scratch counter one D zero. Are you sure? Absolutely. And it's gone forever. And then I can reprogram it again. And then D save, count one. And I'm just doing this to demonstrate the commands. Obviously I didn't have to delete it and start over again. And yeah, that's the scratch command. Now, let's say I wanted to combine a file on one disk with another file on another disk. There is a basic version 4 command called concat, which is short for concatenate, which sounds unnecessarily aggressive. All right, now listen to me. We're sending a message here. You understand? I don't want you to just decapitate this guy. I want you to concatenate him afterward. You got that? Concatenate. Anyway, um... We'll just do a catalog here. So let's say I wanted to basically add 1989 test and 1989 together on drive zero. Drive zero is my test drive. Drive one is my real diary disk that I don't want to destroy. Uh, what I can do is do concat, and then we need the source drive, which is D1, 1989, test two, D0, 1989. 
So that's going to copy 1989 test and append it to 1989 on drive zero. Now I'm going to just catalog D0 so you can see. And note the size of 1989 is almost twice what it was before. So yeah, that's basically how that works. Um, I've tried it with programs, uh, but it doesn't seem to like doing that. I think there's only certain types of files you can do. You can't do relative files, that's in the manual, but you can do sequential. What I was trying to do was combine count one and count two. So I copied count two over to disk one, and then I was going to append it to the end of count one on disk zero, but this is what happens. And then we get an error. Now, I can actually check the disk status to see what that is, and that's error number 64. So whatever error number 64 is, that's what we're dealing with right now, and that's the reason why that didn't work. And if I want to find out a little bit more about that error, I can do print ds file type mismatch. So that's what's going on there. It's basically, I'm not sure why that would be a file type mismatch, because it's the same type of program, but that's what it's saying. So yeah, that's kind of how that works. And yeah, if I wanted to, I could go back and uh, diagnose my backup problem as well. So that's sort of the main commands that you have access to. There's also some commands that are useful for um, programming things like my digital diary that I'll show you in a minute. Um, basically disk operation commands like dopen, which allow you to open a sequential file, append, which allow you to append things to it, and then declose, which closes the file. Uh, those are all things that I used in my diary program to uh, actually save what I was typing in. So yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty useful overall. It's, pre it's pretty trippy seeing these commands on a Commodore 64. It's, it's a little weird. Now, in terms of loading the program, I could just do the standard load diary like that, and then do comma eight and I think comma zero for the drive number. That's one way of doing it. The basic four way would be basically deload and then diary, oops, comma D zero. And there we go. Now I can, I'll list out the program just to see that everything came out okay. Wow. <laughs> I still can't believe I pulled this off. Like this was, I had no idea what I was doing and I still don't. If I was to try to do this today, I would absolutely not be able to do it. Okay, so I'll type run. The official logs, diary is private. <laughs> yeah, like anybody in my household could have figured out how to get this going. Um, but anyway, you can see I've got a little menu here and um, I can open a new diary disk if I want to. I can add to the current year. I can read a given year. I can list the year records available. I can list the dates for a certain year. So let's have a look at what year records are available. Yeah, I mean, it seems to be working. So you can see uh, I've got 1989, 92, 93, and I've got these AB. Again, this was from when I was fooling around with this drive, trying to, trying to get it to work properly. I think I managed to corrupt or damage the original files, but I, I recovered them. Now, again, you see 1989 in there. That was actually a transcription I was doing from a written journal that I had. This, this was actually programmed in 1992. So any of the entries from 1992 are gonna be original as they were happening entries uh, into my pet. Okay, so we'll read a given year. Uh, I've got 1992 AB. And I'll start from, what was that again? 1211, I think. I can't remember if I made it smart enough to just pick the next available date or if it has to be really specific. And you can see too, the, um, this isn't an 80 column screen obviously, and the entries are formatted in a way that they fill up the pet screen and then move on to the next one. So this continue message would typically be at the bottom of the pet screen, but unfortunately, because the 64 doesn't have 80 column mode, it's kind of spread out all over the place. Uh, I hung around the school waiting till four for mom to finish work. <laughs> I played Railroad Tycoon, there we go. That's what I was doing in 1992. And when I got home, we passed uh, some neighbors and I waved to them. I think somebody wears too much makeup. <laughs> Man, I was so brutal back then. I need to start weightlifting again. <laughs> 
And I talked to Panhead Al of Panhead Alley. He's a biker on his BBS. Okay, so this was an old bulletin board that was uh, based out of Toronto. Oh, that's hilarious. Here's the 13th of December, 1992. Today I played Railroad Tycoon some more. <laughs> I was really obsessed with that game back then. It was so much fun. Uh, but apparently I got bored with it and dug myself into the kind of debt that most people would consider nightmarish. <laughs> It's so weird reading this stuff, you know, 30 years later, like I just, I don't remember any of this. Uh, I really wish I had kept up on my journals, but I just didn't. And I talked to Steve something today again. We're gonna play 688 Attack Sub. I remember this. Um, 688 Attack Sub was one of those few games that could actually play in sort of an online mode. You could connect modem to modem, because um, obviously this is pre-internet. And I remember how cool that was, um, just the idea of you being able to play together uh, or fight each other. Oh look, we're playing Railroad Tycoon again. Um, made it into retirement and everything, okay, that's awesome, I became a warden or something. Also unearthed a copy of my favorite song, Wang Chung. Oh boy, uh, I was bopping to it. This is, <laughs> this is bad. I deregulated Midnight Express Net. I've decided to let other local boards in. Holy crap, I've totally forgotten about this. So this was basically uh, my bulletin board that I was running back in the day. It was called the Hilltop BBS. And I had actually set up a private little network, sort of like Fidonet to pass messages around back and forth. Man, I had totally forgotten about that. That is so cool. Uh, so you've read some interesting stuff, I guess. I think this was in case somebody read the uh, diary. I was just letting them know. In case you're wondering, I can't use commas because they mess up the machine. Yeah, that was a problem with this program. Uh, for some reason, I could not get it to accept commas. I think it was just uh, because it was like an operator and it screwed up the programming. Uh, there were definitely some limitations when you were entering stuff in here. Uh, that's okay though, I'm listening to Fantasis. Uh, Fantasis? I have no idea what that is. I think the song is called Spring or something like that. Nice song, I have no idea what that is. Yeah, this, this is the depressing thing about getting old is you get to a point where you have completely forgotten things. If you're out there, if you're a young viewer, I definitely recommend keeping a journal because it's so much fun to go back and look at stuff like this because you just it just gets forgotten, like you don't, all this stuff that was going on every day in my life as a 16 or 17 year old, um, you know, it, it just gets completely forgotten by the time you're in your mid 40s. So it's really cool to be able to, to go back and look at this and see all the things that you were feeling and complaining about. <laughs> Being a teenager, it's probably mostly complaining, but um, yeah, just, just remembering things that you had completely wiped out of your data banks and just had no memory of whatsoever. Hey, the buzzing noise is gone. <laughs> Okay, so this is a problem I've had with my pet. I've never gotten around to fixing it. Every now and again, the transformer makes this horrible buzzing noise and uh, then it just stops. And it's the transformer pretty much for sure, but I don't know why it does it. Uh, excellent, I wonder what I'll do in the future. Oh, <laughs> should I tell him? <laughs> I haven't got a clue, oh boy. Boy, do you ever not have a clue. Um, I need to fix my math marks and go anywhere, but it just seems like there's nothing out there that I want to be. Well, now you've found it. <laughs> That's how you end up on YouTube. 1993 was pretty much when I stopped using this. I just completely forgot about it. 205 and 420. <laughs> awesome. Uh, oh, 205. So I want to read given year, 1993, 02. Oh, five. What am I? I'm surely not the person some think I am. <laughs> this is so classic 16 and 17 year old. Uh, I'm not at all good natured or hopeful. <laughs> Life hasn't, it's just, it hasn't given me my, any vision. <laughs> Jeez, dude, you're 16. This is how it is. Uh, it's like I'm isolated from everyone else. <laughs> Like right now, I'm pretty familiar. Uh, I keep thinking that the world has reached its maximum. <laughs> what does that even mean? Things can only go downhill. Okay. <laughs> like that is the most 
2020 thing ever, right? If only I had known what 2020 would look like and how prophetic that would be. Oh man, uh, God, I'm awful, eh? Well, you know, you're kind of bitter there, dude. So yeah, that's, that's basically, uh, I mean, it seems to be working pretty well. There's a couple of little bugs in there. I'll have to check this out on my pet and see if something's going on. I'm definitely gonna have to make some backups of this because these are the original discs. So look at that dust there. <laughs> They've been sitting in there that long. Uh, so I really don't want to rely on those too much longer. I'll have to find a way to transcribe all this. But yeah, I mean, as you can see, uh, this cartridge does pretty much exactly what it says it's going to do. It gives your Commodore 64 new capabilities that it did not have before. And uh, yeah, it just, it just works. So. Yeah, definitely um, I am gonna make a project of it to try and figure out why this Link 2 cartridge is not working. And then uh, I might maybe set up a project to actually duplicate these so that you know other people can experience and enjoy this. If you've got an IEEE 488 drive sitting around and you wanna use it with your Commodore 64 for some reason, well, Bob's your uncle and you can go for it. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you again soon.